Hi, Archie. I just wanted to let you know that we've been so moved by your story and we have been cheering you on every week. And it's not just because we're partial to the name. This week, Megan's got talent for inspiring others, Eugenie's having a baby, and Harry's determined to make a difference. As we approach this November, it's vital that we reject hate speech, misinformation, and online negativity. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Royal Report, everyone. I'm your host, Sharon Carpenter, and it's been another busy week for the royal family, so let's get right to the news. Last week, Harry and Meghan made an appearance during ABC's Time 100 special. Take a look. Thank you, Time, for including us in this very special evening, and congratulations to this year's transformative leaders and changemakers. You worked tirelessly to create a better world a better global community for all of us. And we thank you and celebrate you tonight. While the Sussexes were not on Time Magazine's list of the world's most influential people of 2020, the royal couple were both selected back in 2018 in recognition of their growing global influence. During Harry and Meghan's two-minute video message, the Duchess took a moment to emphasize the importance of voting in this year's presidential election. Every four years, we are told the same thing, that this is the most important election of our lifetime. But this one is. When we vote, our values are put into action and our voices are heard. Your voice is a reminder that you matter, because you do, and you deserve to be heard. The Duke also reminded viewers of his unique voting history and the need to remain respectful in the weeks before the election. This election, I'm not going to be able to vote here in the US. But many of you may not know that I haven't been able to vote in the UK my entire life. As we approach this November, it's vital that we reject hate speech, misinformation, and online negativity. So as we work to reimagine the world around us, let's challenge ourselves to build communities of compassion. Also last week, we got our first look at the upcoming documentary, Prince William, A Planet for Us All, which will air on ITV in the UK this October. In the trailer, which was shared by the network on social media, the Duke opened up about his love of nature and how fatherhood has given him a new sense of purpose. Now I've got George, Charlotte, and now Louis in my life. Your outlook does change. You want to hand over to the next generation the wildlife in a much better condition. Still last week, Bishop Michael Curry, who delivered that unforgettable sermon during Harry and Meghan's 2018 royal wedding, opened up to People magazine about his memories of that day. While discussing his new book, Love is the Way, the bishop also commented on the impact of the royal couple's connection, saying he, quote, realized that the love of two people for each other brought together, at least for a moment, a world of differences. Last Wednesday, one day before it opened to the public, Princess Beatrice got a sneak peek of her wedding dress exhibit at Windsor Castle. The Norman Hartnell designed gown, which was originally worn by the Queen back in the 1960s, will remain on display alongside Beatrice's recycled Valentino shoes and a replica of her bridal bouquet until November 22nd. Also on Wednesday, Meghan made a surprise appearance during the America's Got Talent finale to show her support for contestant Archie Williams. A source told People Magazine that the Sussexes have been, quote, watching the series and loved him from the moment they first saw him. In the Duchess's brief 30-second video message, she assured Williams that their support is not solely based on him sharing a name with their son. So a very special message to you um, that I will probably be saying all of my life, but on this night, it is specifically for you. Archie, we are proud of you, and we are rooting for you, and we can't wait to see what you do. We're in your corner. Have a good night. On Friday, Princess Eugenie took to social media to share some very exciting news. She and husband Jack Brooksbank are expecting their first child in early 2021. While the source told People magazine that Harry and Meghan sent their congratulations privately, Eugenie's mother, Sarah Ferguson, celebrated with a sweet Instagram post, sharing her excitement about becoming a first-time grandmother next year. 
On Saturday, William and Kate took to social media to share some adorable new photos of their family with esteemed conservation advocate and filmmaker Sir David Attenborough. The photos were taken earlier in the week after the Duke and the documentarian screened his upcoming film, David Attenborough, A Life on Our Planet, which will be available to watch on Netflix October 4th. Looking forward to that for sure. And finally on Tuesday, to mark her role as joint president of the Scouts Association, Kate traveled to West London to visit with a scout group and hear how they've been able to continue meeting during the pandemic. During the outing, the Duchess took part in some fun, socially distanced activities like making cards for a local care home and toasting marshmallows on a campfire. All right, so it's time now for today's guest, People Senior News Editor Erin Hill is with us. Erin, great to see you again. How are you doing? Sharon, great to see you. Doing great. Yeah, we're so glad you're here because I want to talk to you about the Sussex's appearance during ABC's Time 100 special last Tuesday. But first, some Royal Family Time 100 statistics. Since 2004, when Time magazine first launched their annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world, a member of the Royal Family has been named eight times. As we mentioned earlier, Harry and Meghan in 2018, the Queen in 2007, William and Kate has been named eight, not coincidentally, it was the year of their wedding, of course. And then Kate again in 2012, alongside her sister Pippa, and finally, Kate by herself in 2013, which made it three years in a row for the Duchess. So not a bad showing from the House of Windsor. Now back to Harry and Meghan in this year's Time 100. This was the couple's first joint TV appearance since stepping back from royal life. And while we've been watching Meghan become more and more outspoken on the importance of voting, last week was the first time we've seen Harry join in as he urged people to vote and to quote, reject hate speech, misinformation, and online negativity. Now, Erin, just how unusual was it for Harry to make these statements about a foreign election? I'm guessing it might be a first in British royal history. Absolutely. It's not something that's typically done within the royal family. They have a strict nonpartisan policy when it comes to politics. It's against protocol for members of the family to get involved in politics, which is something Harry noted himself during the Time 100 special when he said he's never been able to vote in the UK. So while I didn't endorse any candidates, you know, it's clear that they're taking a stance and Megan called it the most important election of our lifetime. So it was definitely groundbreaking. Yeah, it's true. Harry's comments were technically nonpartisan. And according to the spokesperson for the couple, Harry was simply making a, quote, call for decency. But nevertheless, they made a few headlines. As for the palace response, a spokesperson said, quote, the Duke is not a working member of the royal family and any comments he makes are made in a personal capacity. And Wednesday, we saw President Trump chime in during a press conference when a reporter from the Daily Mail asked for his reaction. Take a look. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle uh, chimed in on the U.S. election and essentially encouraged people to vote for Joe Biden. I wanted to get your reaction to that. I'm not a fan of hers. And uh, I would say this, and she probably has heard that, but uh, I wish a lot of luck to Harry, because he's going to need it. So, Erin, how big a deal was Harry and Meghan's Time 100 message? Would we say mountain or molehill here? And what effect do we think the media's reaction might have on what the couple has to say in the weeks ahead? You know, I think over in the UK, these comments had a different impact than they did here in the US. You know, around this time of an election time, we're used to celebrities and public figures speaking out on the importance of voting, even voicing, you know, their um, praise for certain candidates. So it wasn't a, as a big deal here, considering we don't view the royal family the same way as they do over in the UK. So it's definitely uh, made more of a splash over there because of the expectations that come with members of the royal family and not traditionally speaking out um, on politics. That's kind of a foreign concept to us over here. Um, so it's clear that they're passionate about this issue. I don't think any media negativity is going to, you know, keep them from speaking out on these issues. Now they're officially no longer working members of the royal family. They're free to talk about these issues as they wish. Now they did say that they're going to keep in mind, um, you know, things that the queen would would be proud of them you know, supporting. So whether this toes the line in terms of what's expected of members of the royal family working or not in the UK is being debated. But over here, it, it kind of seemed pretty normal to hear from celebrities speaking out on an issue like this. 
Yeah, so fascinating. Now, there's one final part of the Prince's comments that's been getting a bit of attention as well. Harry said, quote, this election, I'm not going to be able to vote here in the US. So should we be inferring that Harry may be wanting to vote in future US elections and that he may be thinking about applying for dual citizenship, much like Meghan, who is planning to become a citizen of both the US and the UK? Right. He certainly seems to leave the door open for a right saying that in this election um, is pretty wild when you think about it. Two years ago, it was all about the steps Meghan needed to take to become a UK citizen. Now we're talking about the possibility of Harry being a US citizen. Um, you know, he, he would follow the kind of same protocol that Meghan did. They said they were not going to take any um, special steps for Meghan. She wasn't going to get any special treatment. She would follow the same um, kind of protocol and guidelines that any anybody in the UK would, would follow to become a citizen. The same would be Said for Harry over here, um, following the same eligibility requirements. Um, now that he is married to a spouse that's a U.S. citizen, he's eligible for citizenship. Um, he'd likely kind of require him to obtain a green card and then stay in America for at least three years. Now, all this kind of murky of where they're going to be residing full time, it seems to be now the U.S. They did say pre-pandemic they were going to be splitting their time. So the verdict's kind of out on where Megan's UK citizenship um, lies now, that they're not spending the required amount of time in the UK now for her to become a citizen. So we'll see how that uh, develops over time. Now, politics wasn't the only reason Harry was making headlines last week. The Prince also debuted a brand new haircut during a video message for the virtual Trail Walker Relay 2020. So, Erin, what do we think of the new do? I'm loving it. It's really Hollywood, isn't it? It's very LA. He's, <laughs> he's youthful looking. I love the kind of spikes in the front. Um, he looks happy, refreshed. Uh, I think it's a great look for him. It's clear he's embracing that California lifestyle. And we've seen Megan debut a little bit of a different look too this summer. Longer, longer locks and framed layers. So I think, you know, with a new kind of lease on life, a new home, a brand new move, why not have a new look? And it looks great. Yeah, fitting into that new environment perfectly. Yeah. Now, switching gears slightly, hard to believe, but it's already been six months since Harry and Meghan moved to California. The Sussexes, of course, spent the first few months staying at Tyler Perry's Beverly Hills mansion before buying their reportedly $14 million nine-bedroom home in Santa Barbara. Uh, so what can you tell us about how Harry and Meghan, and of course, young Archie as well, are settling in so far? Yeah, a source close to the couple tells us that their home has become a place of peace and that they were craving a smaller community and a slower pace, and that's exactly what they get out there. Um, in addition to a lot of outdoor space for little Archie, the home came with this um, built-in play structure that he'll no doubt have a lot of fun climbing around. And Harry himself said um, during a video call recently that he's just so grateful to have that outdoor space right now when we kind of are in this, um, you know, bit of an isolation time still with the pandemic. So it's nice for them to ha have all that room to run around. I bet. And not to sound like a stalker, but we've been getting more and more glimpses inside their new home thanks to all the video calls the couple's been doing. Uh, from the print of the sheet music for I Love You California, we spotted that during Megan's video chat for Smartworks, to the Dipti candles that made an appearance during Megan's America's Got Talent cameo last week. Erin, tell us about the other little details that we've seen so far. I've been doing the same thing. Anytime I see them in a video call, I'm like looking behind at every little detail to give us any insights what this new home looks like. And it seems to absolutely be reflecting Megan's laid back California style that we saw come through in her Toronto home in Canada airy, cool, yet sophisticated. She's got the white furniture and the splashes of color with these leafy green plants and shelves of books. Of course, her beloved fresh flowers and the dip tea candles, as you mentioned, which she, um, I think is a nod to her royal wedding because she had those um, laid out in the, in the chapel where they got married, also in the reception hall. So it's kind of a little nice uh, homage to that. So a lot of great little details we're seeing. And I love that print of the California anthem in the back laying against their mantle, um, really showing that they're hairy to embracing their new home in California. And we've seen some of the outdoor space as well, where the yeah, dogs definitely. are running around playing. For not only Archie to run around, but we've seen a couple cameos from um, their two dogs. Uh, so that's really sweet to see them, you know, kind of running around the property. So it seems like a great, great space for them. Yeah, I love it. All right. Finally, I want to touch on the financial independence. We know the Sussexes will look into Achieve as part of their big step back. 
In June, we learned the couple had signed with the prestigious Harry Walker Agency, which will be handling the royal couple's paid speaking engagements. And earlier this month, Harry and Meghan's multi-year deal with Netflix was announced. Also this month, we learned that they had officially paid back, as promised, the roughly $3 million worth of renovations to Frogmore Cottage. So, Erin, what can you tell us about how the next six months may look for the Sussexes as far as these new careers? And might they be venturing into other business areas, do you think? No, I think um, they have so many doors open to them, obviously, and we've seen them sort of starting to delve into the areas they want to focus on. With the Netflix deal, it's, it's really the sky's the limit. We're going to start to see a lot of the production deals that they have in place coming to fruition. We know already of two confirmed projects. One is a nature docuseries, which falls right in line with conservationist uh, Prince Harry, and then um, an animated series that celebrates inspiring women, which is definitely going to be spearheaded uh, by Megan. So you can tell that they're um, staying true to their promise to make this content that's going to speak to a lot of the issues that are important to them. That's gonna dovetail into their new organization, Archwell. So those will be their two primary focuses right now. And they're definitely gonna overlap. In addition to seeing them speak out on issues that are important to them, which we've already seen, becoming involved in the Black Lives Matter movement, meeting with community leaders, um, speaking out uh, about the importance of that, and then also with voting, um, you know, talking about the importance of registering vote and making your voice heard, the women's issues we always see Megan getting involved with, and a lot of um, issues that are going to be important to them now as parents. So uh, I think it's going to be a really busy next six months as they really get uh, you know, into the groundwork of their new organization and the Netflix deal. And no reality shows, right? That's right. I mean, with this Netflix deal came a lot of speculation. Will we be seeing them in front of the camera? Now, as far as it goes in, in terms of a reality show, their spokesperson denied that, said they have no plans to have any reality show-esque type thing. So um, we'll see down the line, we're able to see them in some other capacity though. I'm sure we'd all be watching if that did ever make it. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we need to take a quick break, but Erin, please don't go anywhere because we have a bit more to chat with you about. The Great. Royal Report, we'll be right back. Welcome back. People Senior News Editor Erin Hill is still with us. Now, Erin, I want to talk a bit about the Queen and Prince Philip, who have yet another wedding anniversary, the 73rd, fast approaching this November. It's perhaps an understatement to say that the ongoing pandemic has caused a lot of disruption to people's plans all over the world. But I'd imagine that would be especially true for the 94-year-old monarch and the 99-year-old duke. So, Erin, what can you tell us about what I understand has been dubbed the HMS bubble? Yeah, that's definitely the lighthearted term that's been used to describe the team they have around them. And it's an extreme uh, pared down team to protect uh, both of them. And this bubble requires 24 dedicated employees that work in two teams of 12. And so how it works is um, one team is three weeks on while the other is three weeks off. And then the staff spend a week in isolation and they pass a coronavirus test before they're allowed back in for their three week shift to begin. So it's very, um, strict in and of course they want to protect the queen at 94 and philip in his hundredth year um so it's been yeah lightheartedly known as the hms bubble and the idea is that the same staff will travel with them between royal homes to make it safer and easier and more efficient in recent years, Philip spent much of his time at Sandringham, and the Queen's remained at Buckingham Palace. However, this year, the two reunited in March so they could isolate together at Windsor Castle before heading up to Scotland for their summer holiday at Balmoral. Erin, how much of a silver lining has it been for the royal couple that they've been able to spend so much more time together this summer than usual? Yeah, I think it's an incredibly meaningful. Um, if, it, if it wasn't for this, they, they would be li living those um, somewhat separate lives with Philip living in Sandringham at his home there, where he's comfortable, where he has been largely since he retired in 2017. When he retired, he really wanted to get out of that royal spotlight. So he moved um, for his full-time residence out of London and about 110 miles north in Norfolk, where he has more of a, a private private life there. Um, so with the Queen having to remain in Buckingham, they spent a lot of time apart. So it's been, um, I think, amazing for their relationship um, and for the family to know that they're together now um, during these past five, six months. 
Now, the Queen and Philip are currently in Sandringham to, quote, spend time privately at their estate. While Philip will remain at Sandringham, the palace has announced that it's the Queen's intention to return to Windsor Castle in October and visit Buckingham Palace for selected audiences and engagements. Erin, what can you tell us about the couple's full plans and will they still get to see each other? You know, it, it had been said that uh, Philip would remain at Sandringham where he was pre-pandemic while the Queen returns to Windsor and then works in and out of uh, Buckingham Palace, but resides in Windsor. But now um, palace officials are not uh, confirming that that's still the case. We may, because of that HMS bubble that we talked about and that it's such a pared down staff, there may not be enough staff to maintain the bubble both in Sandringham and in Windsor. So it could end up that Philip needs to return uh, to Windsor to be with the Queen so they can maintain that, uh, that, that protective staff. So I think that's the details are still being worked out. So we'll see what happens. And finally, as we mentioned, the Queen and Philip are coming up on their 73rd wedding anniversary on November 20th. It's amazing. Last year, the couple was forced to spend that special day apart. Any idea how they may be celebrating this year? That's right. Last year, the Queen was busy on royal duty while Philip was living in Sandringham, obviously, so they spent it apart. This year, it, it could be that they remain in isolation together. They're going to be able to spend it together, which would be really lovely, and I'd imagine that they'd spend it quietly and then have video calls with family. They've been coming, especially the Queen, really, really well-versed in video calls and Zooms, so um, in FaceTime even, so you can imagine all the grandkids and great-grandkids getting on the phone to wish them uh, happy anniversary. All right, Erin, thank you so much. Great reporting as always. Sharon. The Royal Reports will be right back. Welcome back. It's time now for our social media minutes with our social media correspondent, Gillian Simon. Gillian, how are you doing? Hi, Sharon. I'm doing good. Great to see you. Great to see you too. So what do you have for us today? I love the post this week. Last Monday, Princess Eugenie shared a look at two baby koalas named after her and husband Jack on her Instagram story. After Australia's devastating bushfires earlier this year, the koalas are living in a safe habitat and the princess has played an active part in rebuilding these sanctuaries. Eugenie joked the one named after her was a bit cheeky after noticing her wink. So cute. Last Wednesday, the royal family page marked the 80th anniversary of King George VI addressing the nation during the Blitz. In his speech, he announced a new honor, the George Cross, which recognized the courage of those not serving on the battlefield. The story shined a light on early recipients of the honor and included a photo of Queen Elizabeth awarding the George Cross in 2017. I love that the page highlighted the roots of this very special achievement. Last Friday, following Princess Eugenie's pregnancy announcement, the royal family's Instagram page posted this sweet photo from her 2018 wedding to Jack Brooksbank and noted how delighted they were by the news. The Clarence House page shared the post on its story, showing the entire family is just as excited about the royal baby news as the rest of us. And finally, this past Saturday, we got two new photos of the Cambridge family on the Kensington Royal page. The pics were taken at Kensington Palace last week and feature the family color coordinated in blue alongside Sir David Attenborough after he and the Duke attended an outdoor screening of his new nature film. One of the photos gave us a close-up look at Prince George as he played with a fossilized shark tooth given to him by the naturalist. Fingers crossed we get more pics of the family soon. And that's your Social Media Minute. Great stuff today, Gillian. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sharon. All right, Royal Watchers, that's our show for today. Remember to follow people on Twitter to watch the latest episodes of The Royal Report streaming every Wednesday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. I'm Sharon Carpenter. Stay safe, keep calm, and carry on.